All right, we are returning to our logo project. And at the end of the last project, I opened up a PSD and I brought the SVG file that I saved from vector.com, which wants to open an illustrator here. And I dragged and dropped it onto, this is the mistake I've seen most people make, onto a file in Photoshop I already created. If I try to open an SVG with Photoshop because it's a vector file, it's not going to want to do that. Or not open it in Photoshop, rather. We're using PhotoP. So let me get to PhotoP here. It will force you to rasterize it. You know, it will ask you to pick a resolution and a size. And the whole advantage of vectors is that they're scalable. So we want to keep it as a vector. So instead of doing this, which I don't even know if this will work, take my SVG and open it in PhotoP. There it goes. It opened. And actually, it made it into a smart object, which is pretty nice. But then I have to go into image size, and then I have to change its size. I don't want you to do that. Instead, I want you to open a new file in PhotoP, file new, make that file in inches, 8 inches by 10 inches. This will also make it print ready for our lab and for your midterm critique portfolio by either 300 or 350 pixels per inch. So you, I've set up a pixel grid here. Then I take my SVG and I just drag and drop it on. And then it comes in like a smart object. And what I want you to imagine is that this black space around that white canvas in PhotoP, that black space is your mat. So as you size your logo with Control T, I can hold down Option and it will be perfectly centered. You want to decide how big it should be to look good within your mat. And I do not want you to make it too close to the edges. Like that is not a good decision. You want a little breathing room. So I'll usually bring it down about this much and then just use my arrow key and push it up a little bit because our eye tends to make things fall. So this is just reviewing what I did at the end of the last video. Then you're going to turn your background off. So it's just a free floating cutout and you're going to say file export as a PNG. And that will, that's an online file format. It will go to canvas and it will support transparency. So it's just the black cutout. And I can check that that comes to downloads. If I double click it, it will open in preview and you see that it shows on a gray background. I don't want to see any white shapes. I just want to see black cutout. Now, for those of you who are ready to add color, you go back to your PhotoP file. It's a good idea to save it as a PSD. You're going to duplicate Command J your smart object layer of your black logo SVG. And then you're going to double click on that duplicate layer. Move this off to the side. I'll usually turn my background on of just the white background. Double click on the layer and you'll get to your layer styles. And this is where we can start to play with color. So if I want it not to be black, if I want it to be another solid color, Instead of doing that within vector.com, which you can also do, I can do it all with layer styles while keeping it a vector. So our campus has the dubious honor to have kind of fluorescent green as one of its campus colors. I think they call it spring green. So if I want it to be that, it could be that. But maybe I want to play with a little bit more nuance than that. Remember I said that color is not going to save a bad logo? but it can enhance one. So first make sure you like your black shape. Then what I might do is turn that color off for the time being and instead fill it with a gradient. So I go to my gradient options and instead of black to white, let's choose one of these that's a little bit more dynamic, like warm to cool. This is one I'll use a lot, going orange to purple. 
And then I can play with the opacity of that. But remember that it's on top of something black. So if I take that opacity down, it's going to reveal the black underneath. But I can also play with the scale of it. Like how spread out is that gradient? And I can play with the angle of it. So maybe that angle makes sense because of the direction of my bird. And I can customize the gradient. I can just click on that gradient scale and I can choose different colors. So maybe use this, these kind of blues in there. And I can push it into different parts of the gradient. So here we have a nice little rainbow bird, Roy G. Biv. But I don't have a lot of red, so maybe I need to add some red right here. Maybe I put that at the very edge, move the orange in. So I can get the full rainbow. Then I don't feel like I have enough yellow. So I can do that. Then if I like that, I say OK. And then I can still play with the scale of that, the angle of it. I can reverse its order. Oh, I kind of like that. And that's all just on normal at 100% as a gradient. And if I use this little drop down arrow, I can turn those effects on and off. So now I have two effects. I have a gradient, and then on top of that I have a color overlay of the green. Now I can take the green and maybe pull its opacity down a bit. So that, yeah, it's mostly our campus green, but it's got those nice kind of full, full spectrum gradients going on behind it. Makes it a little bit more interesting. So that's just the color. And using color overlay and gradient is a great way. I could also play with the blending mode. So one of my favorite ways is to, oh, let me not make the tools bigger, let me make the thing itself bigger. There we go. One of my favorite methods, because I don't like things to look too computer generated, and vectors are all about clean and computer generated imagery. So I'll go to effects, and after I've colored it, I'll change the blending mode of the color overlay from normal to dissolve. And what that will do, and then I can play with different opacities, is it will make it look, when it's printed, like it's on kind of a textured paper. I don't think this fluorescent green is the best color for that in this case, but I could try like a darker green, more nuanced green, and that can help. Other things I could try, I could try to use it to darken it. I can use try it to overlay on it, pin light. All these will give you subtle results. And of course, you can play with the opacity. So I kind of like that. And then the beauty is you can always just click them off and on. You can even add multiples of individual effects. So I can do color overlay and I can hit this plus sign and add another color overlay on top of it. I don't usually recommend that because your menus can get really messy. But you have that ability. So I can have a green one on one mode. Or maybe even make this blue, our other campus color, kind of a sky blue. And you can see, you know, if you like what they're doing. So I kind of like that, that intensity of the, the blue and the yellow. And then the red and orange of danger at the corner. And any time I could play with the scale of that gradient, and I could add another gradient going in another direction if I want to. 
This gets kind of nuts, but check it out. And I could just play with this for a long time. So I'll do this gradient, but this gradient I'll put at this angle, and then I'll take its opacity way down, and it will crossfade on top of my other one. I don't know. I expected a reaction there. It's fine. Ooh. So this is how you can get kind of almost that watercolor feel of it, right? Now, if I really wanted that watercolor feel on a white background, I could set the edges to be white, solid white, and solid black. Those aren't officially colors. But what they allow you to do, even though it's a vector and is made with hard paths, if I take this up to 100% opacity and I play with the scale, right? And then if I take the, the color overlays out, it can make it look like those hard edge vector shapes are actually gradating out and losing definition. And this is how, if you layer a bunch of these on top of each other with different colors, you can get it to really look like painting or watercolor or something else, all while keeping it as a vector. And these are all things you can do within the vector programs as well, because this is computer generated raster color that can be expressed within the path of a vector. Okay, but all of that looks kind of bad for this, so I will just change it to a blending mode that doesn't matter so much. And you can overdo the coloring as well. But let's say I do the coloring like that. I can also set this to be dissolve. So that does not look good. That just looks so weird. This is like, actually, that's pretty cool. It's like a lava lamp. And that's the more effect of one gradient hitting another gradient. Uh, let's play with that, but just play with the scale of it. And then play with the, the opacity. Yeah. So if I do that, Yeah, I like that a little bit. Brings the night out. That's just the interior color. Other things I can play with. I can play with a drop shadow. That's why it's nice to have that white background turned on. And I can make that color, that drop shadow, just different opacities of, of black, which is the default. I can play with its distance. I can play with how soft edged it is how sharp it is. That kind of makes it look like it's sitting on top of the paper. I can also play with inner glows, outer glows. You just have to play with these things and see what works for your logo. An inner shadow is like a drop shadow, but inside your image. So you don't usually use an inner shadow and a drop shadow, but you can do it. And then some people really like this, the bevel and emboss. So this is a little different. This makes it look like a 3D object. It will take your edge and it will create a highlight and a shadow based on an angled light source that will match your drop shadow. You can actually make it not match your drop shadow just by unclicking use global light. And then you can set your drop shadow at one angle and you can use bevel and emboss at another angle, which is kind of trippy. And you can play with the opacity of it, of both the highlight and the shadow. So maybe you want mostly highlight. So it looks nice and soft, like it's made out of molded plastic. So that's the bevel and emboss part. The contour part gives you an actual kind of chiseled edge that you can also play with, but you don't have to. Uh, 